Uh, good evening, everyone, and good morning to all our visitors from uh, New York and abroad. Uh, this is our fifth uh, meeting in this series of international lectures uh, dedicated to Marcel Yanko and the uh, Dada movement, to the Dada spirit. Uh, in the first lecture, we talked about uh, Yanko's contribution to, uh, of course, uh, establishment of the Dada movement, his contribution to uh, the Romanian architecture. Uh, and now we are talking about his uh, uh, most important projects in Israel. Uh, last week's lecture was about the establishment of Enhod. And today we are going to talk about uh, Yanko's part in the foundation of a new art movement, a new horizon of Akim Hadashim, as uh, we call it uh, in Hebrew. And uh, today's lecture. Uh, will be given by Dr. Alec Mishori. He's a researcher of Israeli visual culture. And uh, his title is uh, Horizon Nouveau or New Horizon, uh, purposelessly in French. So, Alec, the stage is yours. Alec, don't forget to open the microphone. Can you hear me now? Oh, Alec, we hear you. You can continue. So thank you, Raya. Good, e good evening and good morning to everyone. <coughs> I have a bit of a cold, so I hope not to cough like Mr. Nasrallah, but uh, I will try to, to give my lecture without coughing. Uh, so thank you for joining me. What I would like to do is, uh, is, and Raya knows me very well, I would like to contradict her first sentence by saying that the Ofakim Hadashim or the New Horizons was not an art movement. It is just a name of an exhibition at the Tel Aviv Museum in 1948. So it is very important for me to tell you about uh, Ofakim Hadashim and uh, even the poster, and by the way, I'll go back. An interesting thing about this poster is that it is the, the official poster of the Ofakim Hadashim exhibition. <coughs> it is in the collection of the Tel Aviv Museum uh, graphic uh, room, and I believe, as nobody I think has ever said it before, that of course Marcel Yanko designed the uh, poster that you see. Uh, it is a combination, very interestingly, a combination of a, a creature, some kind of a creature, you know, with four legs, and uh, his face, or its face, is like a, a painting palette with uh, arrows coming out of its eyes and uh, a beautiful placing or beautiful arrangement of the page with the names of the participants at this exhibition. Surprisingly enough, Yanko's name is not there, although he was participating in the exhibition. So, and you have all kinds of uh, mishaps about this uh, uh, poster because uh, things in Israel as ever always happen at the last minute and some names were changed and some names were added, some names were taken off. So this is the official poster, but it doesn't exactly represent the exhibition. At any rate, Ofakim Hadashim, or was, as it says here in Hebrew, it is a, a exhibition of painting and sculpture. And why am I saying that it is not exactly the name of, a, of a, an ideological group in the Israeli historiography of uh, visual culture? I will try to explain 
during my lecture. Now, before I begin with uh, giving you all the details, I would like to say that all of you probably, as I know, um, understand and accept the fact that Ofakim <coughs> Chadashim was a group exhibition. And as you know, group exhibitions have two ways of being conducted. One is that a group of artists comes to a museum, especially nowadays, I'm not so sure that it happened in 1948, but nowadays a group of artists who have a mutual ideology come to the head of the museum or curator of the museum, and they would like to exhibit their works as a group. Another way is to have a group exhibition, uh, which is uh, comprised by the curator himself. So there, there may be some artists who don't even know each other, but the curator thinks that they have some kind, uh, some kind of a thing in common. And Ofakim Chadashim was neither that nor that. It was uh, curated by Chaim Gamzu, who we will meet later on as the head of the Tel Aviv Museum. And uh, he, uh, okay, I'll come to it in a minute. Another thing is that uh, the title of my lecture, I said that it, it is intentionally done in French. Now, why am I saying that? I think that Chaim Gamzu, the head of the Tel Aviv Museum, who organized the Fakim Chadashim show, <coughs> was doing something very interesting and something very daring in a way. Because if you think about 30 years from 1917 to 1948, um, Palestine was under British mandate or under British rule. And if you had some kind of an, exhi uh, of a, an exhibition catalog, um, it would be, of course, in Hebrew, but sometimes it would have an English translation. Now, what Chaim Gamzu does in 1948, he, of course, the catalog uh, is in Hebrew, but the translation is into French. And in this thing, and in this act, he, I think, uh, contributed two new things to the Israeli art scene. First, using French is a change or is some kind of a declaration of independence from the British. The other thing, is doing it in French, in French, would make of Akim Chadashim or would make indirectly the Tel Aviv Museum a part of the universal art scene. Because at that time, just before New York became the uh, center of the uh, um, art of the 20th century after the World, World War II, um, Paris was still the center. So if you do it in French, it gives it some kind of a universal um, adding to its uh, importance. So what I'd like to show you is that Ofakim Chadashim exhibition of 1948 was dealt by at least <coughs> four Israeli art historians and uh, sociologists. The first was in 1980 by Professor Gila Balas, who wrote a book about New Horizons. In 2005, Graciela Trachtenberg wrote a book about uh, na nationalism and art in the early years of the State of Israel. In 2008, which is 60 years to Israel's independence, Gideon Ofrat wrote uh, about Ofakim Chadashim in a catalog of an exhibition held at the En Harod Art Museum. And in 2013, I wrote a book about the first year of Israeli art field uh, that you can see on the left. And I don't think I agreed with many of the authors that you see before me. And you will see in a minute why. Now, in, in order to do something about the Fakim Chandashim, I will talk less about the art and more about the context. And I would like to take you back to 1948, which is a fascinating year, not only from a political or a, a point of view, but from an artistic point of view, but also from a political point of view. 
And in May 1948, to be exact, on the 14th of May, <coughs> on a Friday afternoon, David Ben-Gurion uh, announced the establishment or the birth or the foundation of the new state. And it didn't have a name by that time, just to remind you. It wasn't called Israel yet, but a few days later or a few weeks later, it got its name. And uh, so in 1948, in May, there was great celebrations, not to mention the fact that uh, two or three days later, a war began, the War of 1948, the War of Independence in which Israel fought with um, the Arab countries. So in 1948, <coughs> I want to give you the, a little of the context of what happened in, his, in uh, the newly founded state of Israel. Everybody was interested in the characteristics of the future new Israeli art. You have uh, theoreticians who wrote and published in uh, local newspapers. You have uh, museum curators. They weren't called curators in those days, but they were the heads or the curator of the museums. And they were all seeking what would be the characteristics of a new national art in Israel. Some wanted to analyze it or to think about it by its subject matter. Others were calling it the local color palette. Uh, another thing would be that it would be unique by its style. And if style, what would be the appropriate Jewish style for the new state of Israel? And what is believed to be modern and progressive? These two terms, modern and progressive, were not only the uh, seeking or the uh, contemplation of Israeli theoreticians and the uh, uh, writers, but it was a universal question, a universal issue of what does one mean by modern and what does one mean by progress. So also I'm taking you into four historical <coughs> <clears throat> extremely important uh, dates or extremely important uh, events in the his history of Israeli art. Now, this is the first year of the state. In uh, uh, April 1948, 18 Israeli artists participated at the Venice Biennale. In July 1948, the yearly exhibition of the Association of Israeli Artists A, Sculptors and Painters, was, uh, was opened in Tel Aviv. In July, the same month, 1948, <coughs> a new institution, institution was inaugurated, and it was the House Beit Hatzayal Ve'Apasal, or the House of the Painters and Sculptors on El Harizi Street, which exists, this building exists until this very day. In September of 1948, um, the, is, uh, Tel Aviv municipality gave the Dizengoff Prize that I will talk about. And in November was the epitome of all these events. It was the Ofakim Chadashim, or the New Horizons uh, exhibition at the Tel Aviv Museum. So why am I mentioning the Venice Biennale? The Venice Biennale, as you all know, was the most important event in the art field, in the international art field. <coughs> Inaugurated in the night at the late 19th century, the Venice Biennale was such an important thing because it was a meeting place for artists from all over the world, and they could meet in one place, show their works, and uh, exchange ideas uh, in one place, which was in Venice, of course. But when it comes to the uh, first third of the, of the 20th century, something happened, of course, at the Biennale, because ever since 1933, as you know, the Nazis came to power in Germany and uh, the Duce came to power in Italy, so it was uh, 
what the Biennale uh, exhibited was mainly Nazi art and fascist Italian art. So it wasn't considered a very important place. And you will see that this is significant in a few minutes. I found a very nice thing to show you um, of the uh, collaboration of uh, fascist Italy, <coughs> sorry, with Nazi Germany as uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Goebbels, the um, propaganda minister comes to the Biennale. מה שרציתי להראות לכם ולא הצלחתי באיזושהי צורה, זה יש שם קטע מאוד קצר. I'm sorry, uh, what I wanted to show you was, uh, there was a, there's a very short <coughs> item that shows the, the, the works of art exhibited at the, at the exhibition, but we didn't see it. At any rate, the um, Venice Biennale of the war years was not considered a great place because artists not from all over the world, only the Germans and Italian and probably even Russians at the beginning could meet there. But uh, so in 1946, a year after the World War II ended, they wanted to uh, make the Biennale again. And, uh, but the stage of the, the state of the, of the pavilions there was very bad after the war. So they postponed it to 1948. And in 1948, the Venice Biennale was such an important event that if you think about six uh, years of war, when there was no communication between artists whatsoever, and if you add to this that from 1933, German artists could not meet with any other artists from all over the world, not to mention the Americans, <coughs> the Biennale in 1948 was uh, considered a great international event, and you'll be surprised. Some of the uh, um, newspaper announcements called it, it would be, it would lead to a new horizon of the world. So the new horizon was a, a, a term that many people uh, used. Now, there were many pavilions at the 1948 Biennale, but the most interesting, everybody thinks, was the uh, pavilion that a private collector, Mrs. Miss, uh, Peggy Guggenheim, exhibited her collection at the uh, Biennale. And you can see that she is not a country, but she got a pavilion of her own. And she exhibited the uh, collection of works that she has, that she had in her gallery in New York. One of them was William Biziotis. Another one, you'll be surprised, was Jackson Pollock that she exhibited in Venice. And of course, Mark Rothko, the pioneers of abstract, uh, abstract expressionism in the United States. Now, this was a, an, uh, a, an opportunity for artists 
to make, oh my God, easy. איזה כיף לך שאתה מעשן. It was a meeting place for, a, as I said, the international community of artists, and, uh, but it was a very conservative one. For example, Marino Marini, the Italian sculptor, got first prize for sculpture. Henry Moore got the, also a prize for sculpture. And Georges Braque also got the sculpture for painting. Jean de Buffet, as you can see, was not considered worthy of the uh, Biennale. <coughs> the head of the Biennale, or the main curator of the Biennale, was Rodolfo Palucchini. But uh, another person that nobody ever knew about, his name is Angelo Fano, a, a former Venetian. He immigrated to Jewish Palestine in 1936, but was Uh, originally, he was born in Venice. So he was corresponding with Rodolfo Palucchini and suggested to have a pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Now, I want to remind you that uh, the Biennale opened in April. The State of Israel was declared in May. So there was a problem how, I mean, nobody knew at that time what, how to call the pavilion at the Venice Biennale, but I'll come to it in a minute. <coughs> From the correspondence of Rodolfo Palucchini and uh, Angelo Fano, the Association of Artists, uh, of uh, Sculptors and Painters, sent a list of 24 participants. Later on, it, it, it had an updated list of the Artists Association, and it was reduced into nine. The final is 16, participants with two people who really stole the thing and sent their paintings without asking, without asking anyone. And this is Mr. Frankel and his wife. So you can see that the mischief begins even then. Now, Horizon Nouveau, from here to the end of my lecture, I called it a game of political power and money. I am sure that if you read all the publications of, on Ofakim Chadashim by most of the Israeli or maybe international uh, scholars who dealt with it, you will get a beautiful picture, a greatly politically correct picture of what a beautiful uh, exhibition it was, which is true. And God forbid, I'm not trying to say anything that is not Uh, correct about these people. They were very, very talented artists, but they were also people. And people, as you know, some of them have played games of political power and money, and artists are not uh, anything else. So the list, as I tell you, was the 16 participants. But there were other very, very talented and very important Israeli artists who were not included in the list to participate in the Venice Biennale. On the right, some of you will recognize uh, Menachem Shemi. After all, going from right to left, this is uh, uh, Aaron Avni. And then Moshe Mokadi, and on the extreme left is Yechiel Krize. None of them were invited to the Biennale. And again, from left to right, this is a, a what's his name? The second is uh, uh, Ariel Lubin is on the left. Then there is Michael Kara. And then there is the most, the greatest, I think, Israeli sculptor of those days is Ze'ev Ben Tzvi and Paldi on the, on the right. All of them were not invited. And as I told you, because the Biennale opened in April 1948, <coughs> Palukini asked Angelo Fano from Palestine, what would he like to call the uh, pavilion? And finally, I'm not, I don't have too much time to, to, to tell you about it because the correspondence is very, very interesting. Finally, it was decided to call it Eretz Israel, Artisti Palestinesi, or the land of Israel, Jewish, uh, I, I'm sorry, Palestinian artists. And uh, as you can see the, in the middle of the pavilion, was a sculptor, sculptor by 
Dov Fagin, uh, carrying the title of a Canaanite woman with a harp. I'm going back to uh, just to sum up what happened in Venice. And it is very, very important to say that all the works or almost all the works exhibited by the Israeli artists at the Biennale were sold for a very nice sum of money. Um, another context I would like to take you that surrounds the origins or the, the aspects of the, of the New Horizons uh, exhibition is that you have to think what was happening in, in the world or in the visual arts in the world in the late 1940s and the beginning of the 1950s. <coughs> you see on the right, of course, Jackson Pollock, and he represents uh, the American supposedly uh, very open and very personal and very individual art. And on the left, you see a uh, social realist style of the Soviet artists, both were in the world. Now, another thing that not too many people talk about or relate to is the public or the audience. We know so much about the artists, we know so much about the art. What about the public reception or the, pu the public conception of modern art? And it turns out that in the late 40s, all over the world, not only in Jewish Palestine or, in, or later on in Israel, <coughs> people didn't, didn't have too much understanding of modern art. And on, on, worse than that, they did not like it and looked down on it. So I'm giving you a, a small uh, story that I found in an Israeli newspaper in 1948. There is a story about a French woman who gave birth to a son with four legs, large head, and a double face, one ear, and no eyes. When asked if she saw something during her pregnancy, she told reporters that she saw in her dream a strange creature, um, and everybody agreed that she saw a painting by the modern sculptor Picasso. Ever since she's showing off her creature in fairs, and she calls him Picasso's child. Now, of course, this is a very uh, ironic uh, story, but this is, it, I think it reflects the audience uh, uh, understanding of the modern art. Now, another thing that we have to get to know is the Dizengoff Prize, another <coughs> very significant event in 1948 the first year of the State of Israel. Every year, the uh, Tel Aviv municipality gave a prize. And the prize was only and only and solely to members of the Association of Painters and Sculptors. And I made a diagram to show you what was going on. The Tel Aviv municipality had 200 pounds is the Dizengoff Prize. Now, every year, the Association of Sculptors and Painters had an exhibition. So a jury made of X number of municipality members, X number of the Association of Artists, and X number of the Tel Aviv Museum persons <coughs> would go to see the exhibition and would decide who is going to win the prize? Now, the jury uh, changed from one year to another. There were endless fights about the jury because each um, participant in the jury or representative of the, of a, excuse me, the uh, institution, they wanted to have more members. So the association wanted to have less members from the Tel Aviv Museum, et cetera, et cetera. So 200 pounds were given to the artist association. If one artist won, he would get 200 pounds. If 10 artists won, each one would get uh, 20 pounds. Now, after they have chosen who to give the prize to, it wasn't really a prize. It was a sale because they bought the painting from the artist and the painting went 
directly to the collection of Israeli art at the Tel Aviv Museum. Now, if you think about the character of the, of the jewelry, <coughs> sometimes the Tel Aviv Museum art collection or the curator of the museum received works that he didn't really want to because some of them were chosen by the jury members of the Association of Artists of uh, Sculptors and Painters. So this is another money thing that happened in 1948. After the Biennale, uh, there was a, a very stormy night at uh, Chaim Glicksberg, who was the head of the Association of Painters and Sculptors at his house. And uh, a group of people or a group of artists decided that they don't want to be anymore members of the association of sculptors and uh, uh, painters. And there is a, there's a, a document that testifies to it that a group of, of artists <coughs> decided to go and have coffee at the Kassit Cafe in Tel Aviv and decided not to be members of the association anymore. Now, the third uh, event that I told you about was in July 1948, and it was the general exhibition of the uh, Israeli artists in July. It had 122 participants, a huge number, that no space could uh, hold the exhibition for them, and each one could uh, exhibit one single work. And a day after the opening of the yearly exhibition of the Association of Painters and Sculptors, a public statement was published in Haaretz in which 15 artists <coughs> declared that they don't want to be any more members of the association because they claimed that the uh, exhibition did not, did not go along with their uh, principles. Just to let you know that 11 of the 15 co-signers exhibited and sold their works in the Biennale in Venice. So there was no need for them to participate in the, in the exhibition because they already sold their works and made enough money. And in the yearly exhibition, they could wait. And uh, they didn't know who would, uh, who would be chosen the, to have his uh, work bought by the Dizengoff Prize. And of course, there was an answer by the association and they claimed that that group of, person, of uh, artists, <coughs> excuse me, was uh, uh, not paying attention to the rules of the association and they did it only for uh, to have some kind of a mutiny. Okay. The group of artists, these 15 artists who did not participate at the exhibition in, uh, in the yearly exhibition, uh, was called in the newspapers in the beginning as the progressive group, and I'll come to it in a minute. And you can see that there was a beautiful uh, cooperation or collaboration between certain uh, institutions and persons uh, supporting them. You see on the bottom right, it's Chaim Gamzu, the head of the Tel Aviv Museum, Eugen Kolb, who was a, a prominent art critic. <coughs> on the right is Yosef Zaritsky, one of the most powerful and a friend of Marcel Yanko. And uh, at the, on the left, you see poet Avraham Shlonsky. Now, all of them participated in supporting the group. And if you just look at the things that they said about them and published, I mean, they, they wrote about them, it was, it is completely surrealistic, I think. Chaim Gamzu, the head of the Tel Aviv Museum, compared the uh, group of 15 uh, artists to impressionism that separated itself from the academic painting. Eugen Kohl said that they're like the Wiener Secession artists who separated themselves from academic historicistic, historicist painting. 
Shlonsky was the greatest who made a Jewish uh, connection. And he said that Patriarch Abraham separated himself from his father Terach and his people and began a new culture. So Ofakim Chadashim, or the progressive group <coughs> was given such great significance that uh, gave them the power to uh, call themselves a very significant group. Um, now, when uh, I'm, I was talking to you about the two exhibitions, the yearly exhibition of the Association of Artists uh, in July, and in November, the uh, New Horizons group, uh, New Horizons uh, exhibition at the Tel Aviv Museum. Now, I read the two manifestos, quote unquote, or the two, the two uh, very short wording of what they think. And the yearly exhibition, they said that artists do not copy reality. A painting and sculptural piece can be of art, which, we, which is the sole uh, phenomenon that would remove the barriers that separate, separates it from its audience. Now, when you come to Ofakim Chadashim, what is the horizon? There are lots of things. Uh, four artists wrote something, including uh, um, um, <coughs> what's his name? Marcel Yanko. But Yosef Zaritsky wrote that this is a mistake to uh, by those who claim that this future art will be naturalistic. We are ready to explain it, its ways and forms to the public. So if you look at this, it's a, just a different wording for the same idea. First of all, it is not going to be realistic or it's not going to, to copy reality. <coughs> the second is we, the artists, are willing to explain it to the public. So it is so much alike that there's nothing new in the, open, in the New Horizons exhibition uh, manifesto that compares it with the one from the uh, yearly exhibition. And I think that it was written by the same person. But let's leave it. The Cobra Manifesto, if you think to 1948, the Cobra Group, if you look at the manifesto of the Cobra Group, they are coming together, people from Copenhagen, from Brussels, and from Amsterdam. And they say, we have a common thing that we would like to stick to. We would like to uh, invent a new style that we would like to go with. And the other thing, which is most important, we feel that we have a loyalty to one another. None of these things you have in the manifesto of the Open Horizon exhibition. And to remind you that in the Open, uh, the New Horizons exhibition, there were 18 participants, not 122. <coughs> and they can exhibit five to six works, each artist, as opposed to the one to the yearly exhibition. There was a lot, I'm, I'm trying to save time, a poet Alexander Penn uh, wrote a, a severe um, critique. He criticized the uh, New Horizons group and what he was very right with, and you, if you think about it positively, he did not say that the uh, group of artists that exhibited at the New Horizons exhibition were bad artists, on the contrary. But what he said is, you're not the only ones. So why you have the power and the place at the Tel Aviv museums and others were refused. I think that there is some kind of an answer with the use of a, a, a term that was very typical of those years, and the term is progress. It is taken, by the way, from Soviet thinking. And it is a search for something new with social obligation. When it comes to the visual arts, none of the people who talk about it, not a single one, <coughs> could explain how it would find its formation 
in the Israeli uh, low, uh, figure of arts. So if you, if you look at these things, Muriel Bentwich on the left, uh, Mordechai Lebanon in the middle, and uh, I can't say, ah, it's Chaim, it's Chaim Glicksberg at the far right, are not progressive. These are progressive. Kahana, who is, uh, I'm sorry, it's a pure imitation of Brack. And uh, uh, yeah, or yeah, not Brack, I forgot. But uh, if you think it, in the middle, this is Zaritsky, and he is doing what's, what can be called as an homage to uh, Georges Brack. And on the right, it is Abraham Naton, who is almost a copy of Paul Klee. So these are uh, progressive. When you look at sculpture, Dov Fagin sculptures are progressive, but Aaron uh, um, is not progressive. And you can see why, because it resembles too much Aristide Mayol, who is not co considered uh, progressive, is only modern. So if you see three heads by Dov Fagin uh, on the right and Mikhail Kara on the left, uh, Dov Fagin's head is progressive because it is a little primitive. Or, but if you think about uh, why was he so, uh, why did he get such compliments, Dov Fagin? Because of its resemblance to Henry Moore. <coughs> but if you think about his sculpture in 1948, that's more than 20 years after Henry Moore's reclining figure, of 1922, not to mention Henry Moore's reclining figures of the 1930s that were almost abstract. And Dov Fagin couldn't even dream about abstract abstraction in 1948. So, and again, not a single Israeli sculptor or painter in 1948 knew Germaine Richier or Barbara Hepworth or Julio Gonzalez, who were doing their modern innovations in international sculpture, but none of it was in Israel. So the, the word progress, you have to check it very, very carefully. So the whole thing about this exhibition of new horizons, some, are, some scholars claim that this was the invention of Israeli abstraction. So if you look at the catalog, I have the catalog and you call it a catalog, it's a four page uh, brochure. If you look at the catalog and you look at the list of paintings and sculptures, not a single one is abstract in 1948. Now, later on, people all over the world was doing abstract sculpture and painting, so it wasn't a a great invention by the Israeli artists. <coughs> so in summing up the exhibition of 1948 that carried the name of Akim Chadashim or New Horizons, um, it was more a political power of a group of 18 people who shoved aside others, very, very interesting and very, very good artists just because they had good elbows and they could make their way and convince uh, Chaim Gamzu, the head of the, Israel, of the Tel Aviv Museum, to have a special group exhibition for a selected group as opposed to the yearly exhibition of 122 artists. <clears throat> but if you think that the power and money uh, stopped there, I'm taking you to 1950 in Venice, the Biennale two, two years later, and of course, in Israel, Moshe Mokadi, one of the Salon de Refusé, who was not accepted to the 1948 Biennale, was appointed the head of the deputy of the arts at the Ministry of Culture. <coughs> and there was a jury. And the jury consisted of some uh, um, artists who also were not in the Venice Biennale. And finally, artists chosen for the Biennale was 
six or yeah something like this also the ones who were refused at the beginning at the 1948 and in 19, uh, 20, uh, 1952 was supposed to be another biennale and uh, the ministry of culture in israel got a report from uh, some of the uh, uh, foreign office people and they said that the focusing on a small number of artists <coughs> create a wholeness and intensifies the impression of the works. And of course, they accepted. So three were chosen. Rubin, Mokadi, and Yanku. And the three of them exhibited their works at the 1952 uh, Biennale in Venice. 1952, architect uh, Zeev Rechter, designed and constructed the pavilion of the Venice Biennale. But it is amazing what Rubin, for example, exhibited at the 1952 Biennale. You can see on the wall the, picture, the paintings that he exhibited there. One of them is called Self-Portrait with a Flower from 1922. Really, as you can believe me, it was progressive or avant-garde. The other thing you see on the left, the official uh, picture or the photograph from the Biennale, he exhibited another very progressive and avant-garde painting, which is him and his wife or his betrothed of 1929. Rubin apparently wanted to make money, but Eugen Korb, the deputy who sent himself to Venice, uh, to report on what's going on there. He said that the Israeli paintings were meant to be sold, but the prices were so high, not a single one was sold. So everybody was disappointed, but they didn't get their money. And Marcel Yanko uh, also participated there. So this is the end of my story. And I hope you don't think that I'm a party pooper. But uh, I don't think that the whole idea of the uh, um, of Hakim Hadashim or New Horizons was something that really received a lot, a lot of uh, research. And not only that, if you go to public auctions in Israel, even nowadays, although it is getting down, <coughs> you would see works by the so-called New Horizons group, that was never a group, uh, you would see that they sell for more money than other paintings or sculptures by other Israeli artists. In 2016, the Museum of Art at Ein Charon curated an exhibition and called it New Horizon for New Horizons, and apparently put all kinds of abstract sculptures not from 1948, from the late 1960s and 1970s, uh, sorry, 1960s, that, uh, I mean, it was not a big deal, not a, not a big deal to have abstract sculpture, but it was never done at the beginning. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alec. Uh... Uh, do you have any questions? Anybody would like to uh, comment something? This is the time to open the microphones. Uh, everybody's in a shock. Uh, yeah. I have a I have a question to I, Alec. I shock. <laughs> well. <laughs> Telling the truth, why shock? Yeah, but you know, this is not what we were taught in the, the university. Uh, because I was taught, you know, for the rest of my life, since I was born in Tel Aviv, that there would be peace. So I was taught. <laughs> yes, everything is political. Any, anyway, uh, could you uh, say a few words about Yanko's part uh, in the New Horizon exhibition, or you don't say group, but 
um, beside the, the poster and so-called the logo, uh -huh. um, could you tell us a little bit how you see it? Okay, do you know what painting uh, um, Yanko exhibited at the Ofakim Hadashim uh, exhibition? Yeah, most of them are, uh, are not abstract. None of them are abstract. Some are. Right, so I'm, I'm gonna tell you, one of the big paintings that he had there is called, was called by Yanko himself, Nocturno. Yeah. Okay. And Nocturno, he had a series of paintings that he took the titles from music. Yeah. Uh, 60 years later, Gidon Ofrat curated an exhibition at the Encharod Museum, as I said, and lo and behold, the title of the work was Mot HaChayal, Death yeah. of the Soldier, okay? Later on, or uh, before the exhibition by Gidon Ofrat, I curated a, an exhibition at the Encharod Museum, and uh, I talked to Daddy or Daddy, I don't remember. Da Daddy, Daddy. Daddy Yanko. And I wanted to have the <coughs> Nocturn, Nocturno for the exhibition. And she said to me, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, it, I know. It is hanging on the wall in your living room. Yeah, so, no, no, it wasn't. It was in the museum. <laughs> and so she said, ah, Mota Chayal, the death of a soldier. Yeah. Said it all depends who you would like to believe. If you believe Gidon of Rat, this is one thing. If you believe your father, it's another thing. Because if you go to the catalog of 1948, he called it Nocturno. He didn't call it Motachayal. And by the way, there is no soldier in the painting. So, in answering your question, Yanko, together with Zaritsky and Streichmann, were the three most influential artists. And as I said, that Alexander Penn and Katonti, I'm very young and little as compared to Alexander Penn, it is not, God forbid, that I'm saying that the uh, works of art were not good. The only thing I was trying to say is that they were the ones who were exhibited and others were not. So coming back to Yanko, yes, he was very, very influential. Yes, he... Only if you think, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the lecture last week about Ein Hod. His contribution to the art scene in Israel is uh, something that one takes into, uh, takes for granted, which is true. <coughs> I do not think that either the style of Zaritsky or the style of Marcel Yanko influenced other Israeli artists, although I might be wrong, I don't know but his contribution was great. What we know about Marcel Yanko, and we praise and uh, appreciate his uh, endeavors and his enterprises as an artist is one thing, but I think I'm not making a great news by saying that Marcel Yanko was a great businessman. He knew exactly what to do. And if you think that at the beginning of Einhold, you know what Einhold was supposed to be? He wanted to build a hotel there. Yeah, I know. It's either for new immigrants or a hotel, yeah. yes. I, I, I know the story. And then he was, of course, working for the art, art, art uh, colony in Yafo, which is, if you think about it, the greatest uh, real estate place in the state of Israel. So. He also was a very, he had a great financial mind as well. Yeah, that's not bad. What? It, it's not bad to have a financial mind. Bad. I just said that this is one of the things. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's more, more or less the basic that uh, Enhod was established. Uh -huh. that's right. right. This is why he did all those workshops and galleries. But this is another story. So, uh, any, uh, thank you very much. Any other questions? I, I want to ask a question. Yes, Izzy. About my English. Um, how long Yanko saw himself as part of, of a team for the team? I don't like, know. Like it did last for the, to the 70s or he 
left the group or, or nothing of that? I don't know. All I can tell you is that Ofakim Chadashim had 12 years, yearly exhibitions in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, and sometimes also in En Chavot. But the reason I said that this is not a group, if you look at the catalogs and if you look at the names of the artists who participated in those 12 years, you see that true, there is a core group of Yanko, Streichmann, uh, Abramovich and Zaritsky, etc., etc. But the others were changing each year. So how can it be? It's not a group. It's not a group that is tied together with an ideology. It's just a group that keeps changing. But they lasted for 12 years, for God's sake. Too much. Thank you. Yes, I, I can answer you that it wasn't until the end of this um, a series of exhibitions under the title of uh, New Horizon. I don't remember whether he was seven years or eight years, but he wasn't until the end. Emmy, where, where are you? In Israel? Who? Emmy. Emmy Averbach. No, who is it? I'm... Yes, I'm in Israel. No, but I, who just talked to me? Ah. No, it, it wasn't me, it was Raya. Yeah, I was talking. Now, Michael Finkelstein, uh, who talked to me? The guy with the beard. Easy, easy. Easy is a curator in our museum. Oh. Uh, and he had this uh, question and I answered that, uh, I don't remember how many years, uh, Yanko wasn't part of this uh, uh, not group, uh, all those 12 years. He uh, left, I think, after eight years or so. Am I right, Alec? I don't know. I really don't know. Well, we'll check the list at... Uh... I really don't know, because I followed the Fakim Hadashim to 1952, not after that. OK. Anyway, um, that's more or less. If there aren't any other questions, this is the end of today's meeting. I just want you to know that uh, this is also the end of part two in the series. And uh, next week we are starting the last uh, part. And uh, we're not going to talk about Marcel Yanko. This is the part of the spirit. And we are going to have uh, two lectures by uh, uh, two uh, uh, members of uh, the Ben Gurion uh, Hanegev Univer University. Uh, Dr. Tihila Sadeh is going to talk about uh, Yael Bertana, and uh, Dr. Ronit Milano is going to talk about Damien Hirst, of course, with the connection of the spirit of Dada. And you're all invited. You could use the same link and see you next week. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. It was very Thank interesting. You. Very Thank interesting. You. Thank you.